Uh, welcome to everybody um, and thank you for, for joining this webinar, um, which is about leveraging culture to emerge even stronger from disruption. Um, I am Duncan Wardley. I'm uh, a partner in Hydric and Struggles. I specialise in um, cultural and behavioural change. I've been working with clients um, on such programmes for uh, nearly 25 years now, and I'm joined by uh, my colleague uh, and fellow partner, uh, Amy Turner, who uh, also specialises in uh, culture shaping with clients. Um, so in terms of uh, today's session, um, I'll just go through the high level objectives with you all. Um, hopefully, Joe, you can move us on a slide. Here we go. Uh, so we've got about uh, 45 minutes today. We'll definitely uh, keep you to time. Um, uh, what we will do is we'll start by actually reviewing some of the, the positive behaviours uh, and outcomes that uh, have been thrown up by this, um, this amazing and unprecedented time we're all living through uh, in terms of the crisis. There's obviously, uh, there's, been, there, there's been a lot of downsides to the crisis, but there has been a big upside as well in terms of some of the behaviours that many organisations have seen. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at some of those and actually ask some of your opinions on what you're seeing in your own organisations. Uh, importantly, though, we'll explore some of the reasons uh, that we're seeing these um, uh, improvements in certain behaviours, certain outcomes across organisations, uh, and try to understand some of the motivations. Uh, and in doing so, that will help us understand how we can prevent a return to old habits. Uh, then we're just going to discuss um, how you will actually go about uh, changing a culture of an organisation at pace at scale to emerge even stronger from the crisis. Um, just a few words on uh, on logistics. As I said, we've got about 45 minutes. The, the idea is that we will lead you through uh, a presentation, Amy and I. Um, it will be um, uh, somewhat interactive in that we'll be asking some polling questions along the way. Um, and, um, you know, we'd like you just to uh, to consider and reflect on the questions and then we'll get some instant responses and, um, and please do participate because uh, that will help sort of determine really the direction that the conversation goes. Um, the other thing I would say is that you know we're all on a, on a big Zoom call here, I'm sure we're all used to working uh, with Zoom and other similar platforms, but there is a chat function. Uh, what I would ask is that if people do have, uh, have questions that they want to ask, um, please just put those on the chat um, and there will be a, a section we're going to leave um, for Q&A. You can pick up any questions uh, at, at that time. So um, if we can, uh, we can move on, we're going to start by perhaps testing some of the technology with a, an early poll uh, just to see how well this works. Um, uh, simple question, we just want to ask uh, where in the world you're joining us from and hopefully you will have seen a poll question appear on your screen um, and um, yeah we can just see attendees viewing the question uh, those of you can if you can just uh, respond to that answer um, and I'll just give it uh, a couple more seconds um, and I didn't know actually it just it showed you live isn't it? how, uh, how so these bars go up and down as it's, as it's uh, uh, as people are answering the questions, but uh, thanks very much. That's um, that's terrific. So um, that's that's quite interesting. I thought it would be mostly home team, uh, the UK, but actually it's mostly mainland Europe. So uh, yeah, welcome all of you, and uh, and also those from Middle East and APAC. I suppose this is it's, this will be uh, towards the end of your day, and uh, very grateful for all of you joining. It's uh, it's great to have such an international audience. Um, so, um, Joe, if you can perhaps close that poll for us now, um, and that pop-up box should disappear from the, the screen. If that's, if that's not happening for you, then um, just click the, the close tab uh, on the, the poll pop-up, and that will disappear. Um, Right, so uh, actually mine keeps popping back up again. 
slight technical hitch there seems to have gone now okay so um so yes welcome all and um, what we thought we would start the webinar with is looking at some of the positive behavior shifts um that we've observed through conversations with our clients and, and we will ask you all in a minute to uh, perhaps identify some of your own your own so start to reflect on those now but um what we have uh, uh, certainly identified is uh, certainly observed is that uh, we tend to have seen uh, or have reported behavior shifts in organizations that uh, fall across three broadly interconnected areas which are uh, we've seen increases in caring we've seen increases in collaboration and we've seen increases in adaptability um, so just take, taking those uh, one at a time um, the, the caring point is interesting i think when the uh the pandemic first broke i think most employees employers really took an they took an employee first um approach to the pandemic um absolutely focusing on quite rightly on keeping their employees safe um and uh, and caring for them recognizing um the you know the 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 stresses and strains that this pandemic has put upon employees um, I, I think that has has kept going. I think uh, what's what's been interesting, certainly what we've observed, is that you know when uh, you know at a human level, when we are at risk, and in fact when we even are confronted, you know, as some have been in uh, this pandemic with their own mortality or the mortality of people that they know, we tend to become more caring. This is you know this is well researched, um, you know, response. Um, and we tend to become more pro-social in our behaviours. And I think that that's, that's really started the process. And I think maybe many organisations even over-indexed on caring when the pandemic first started. Uh, many, many check-in calls, um, uh, you know, opportunities before any meetings started just to see how people were doing. Uh, I think that has calmed down a bit, but uh, a key driver now for, I think we're seeing those caring behaviours continue, uh, is really the need for strong social relationships. Um, and uh, that, that is a, a key fundamental human need and one that has definitely been affected by many of us having to, to work at home. Um, and, um, you know, what, you know, we do, we do know, for example, that, um, uh, you know, having strong social relationships is particularly good for your health. Uh, poor social relationships, um, are, on the other hand, um it is really really bad for your health i mean there's lots of research that shows this um you know it can can actually increase your likelihood of dying by 50 percent regardless of age sex or health status so um uh, social disconnection is at least as harmful to people as many physical ailments as obesity physical inactivity smoking 15 cigarettes today all of those uh, a day all of those combined you know poor social relationships and lack of social connection uh, has that sort of impact and i think you know we we've all recognized this as lockdown has continued and that that sort of caring mentality has continued as we find ways to try and connect more and more with each other um, we've certainly seen more uh, collaboration uh, as a result of the, the the pandemic this has been uh, great to see i think silos have broken down um, people have teamed around new challenges organizations have pivoted quickly to new delivery models uh, and, and I think if you start to sort of unpack some of the reasons why I think um, you know a lot of uh, uh, sort of politics and um, you know silo behavior has really been subordinated to a, uh, a more immediate and common goal that everyone can can buy into and that's that's really driven high levels of collaboration uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, and we'll explore this a bit later in the call um, how much that will continue as we emerge out of COVID uh, and, and, you know, the third big area I'd say we'd observed is, is in the adaptability space. This is, um, you know, the, the, the absolute need to be able to pivot quickly. Many people are sort of delivering services virtually. Uh, they've had to change business models. They've had to change the way they serve customers. And, and organisations have done this in an in, incredibly adaptable and, and speedy way, oftentimes making changes in a matter of days that might have taken otherwise, you know, weeks, months or even years. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's just some examples of the positive behaviours certainly we've observed, but, but very keen to get some uh, input from the group. Um, so we are, we are going to pop up another uh, polling question um, just to uh, explore your experiences here. 
uh, that will pop up in a second. Um, and this will be, again, just, it's not going to be an exhaustive list, um, but what we want you to, to, to answer here, and, and, and do reflect on this, think about it carefully, um, you know, what have you seen more of in your organisation that you would like to keep since the start of the pandemic? And these, you know, some of these are behavioural, some of them are, are more sort of outcome related. Um, and um, the other thing I would say um, is, um, and, and you know, we have, I think we've got people jumping on the chat already. As I say, it's not an exhaustive list. So uh, you, you can add to the chat as well if you think there are other key behaviours um, that you have seen that you've, you know, would like to, um, uh, you know, you, you've really valued through, through the pandemic. Uh, we'll just keep this open for a little bit longer, maybe another 20 seconds or so. I think people are um, starting to uh, starting to answer the questions. Many of you have voted. Really interesting to see how the answers are evolving as you answer these questions. Um, okay, I think we're probably just about there, so maybe we can um, close that vote now, Joe, and just let's have a look at the uh, look at the results. Uh, so the poll results are up, and um, yeah, really interesting. So uh, again, many of you have, I think, sort of reinforced what we've been saying around collaboration. I know care and agility are both high there as well. Also, the resilience point, I think that is really interesting how uh, people have shown amazing resilience through this, uh, through this pandemic. Um, and, you know, as we are in, you know, pandemic or no pandemic, we are in a, a VUCA world, as people often talk about, and uh, the importance of resilience can't be uh, underestimated, really. So um, I think that's fantastic. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look on the chat to see if there was... Uh, there, there was there was one um, from Brian saying that it's not it's um, just that people can be getting a bit jaded now. So although they're showing up, there you know there's the there's the risk mm. of that being um, going back to old habits and waning. Yeah, yeah I think well, but, yeah, and thank you for that, Brian. I think that is a, a fantastic point, and um, you, you could. Could almost have asked you to plant that question because um, what we're going to be coming on to now is really to start to to look at the sustainability of some of these behaviours. I, I think the key message from this is that uh, there there are positive behaviours coming out of the pandemic, um, but the point is I think unless we are intentional about wanting to keep those behaviours, about shaping our culture in a way that keeps these behaviours in place, some of them will start to wane, some of them will be less sustainable. Uh, and the way that um, I was keen to explore that um, is by looking at the reasons we think we are seeing these behaviours. I started to allude to some of them when I was you know, talking about those three broad areas that we'd observed. Um, but if we can close that pop-up box on that, um, on that poll, um, we're going to now have another question for the group, which is looking at, uh, at motivation. So, you know, th those behaviours that you've all identified, that you've seen in your organisations, have a think about the main reasons you think that people have been exhibiting those behaviours. Uh, so, you know, what's changed? What's behind it? Uh, and you'll see here that there is you know, there are a number, again, not a fully exhaustive list of, of motivators here. Um, but what you think, you know, if you can pick your, perhaps your top three, what you think have been the key reasons for um, the behaviours that you've observed. You know, has it been emotional pressure to perform? Has it been the fact that we've all got a common goal we can all get behind? Uh, we have a heightened sense of purpose, you know, et cetera. Um, uh, 
So I can see we've got some votes coming through. We'd love to get just a few more on this. Uh, we've got about 40% of you have voted so far. So um, I'll just keep this open for another 20 seconds or so. Thank you. I don't know if it's just me that can view the questions, the answers as they come in. Maybe it is. Uh, you will see the you will see the results, the, the big reveal in a moment. Um, okay, I think we've got a good number there. So perhaps Joe, if you can close that, and um, you'll now be able to see the poll results. Um, and again, a really good and interesting mix. I like the fact that we've got, um, you know, well, a, a common goal here, a common, a heightened sense of purpose and common goal. Uh, you know, they're, they're very high responses, um, but also, you know, key and important up there is essentially, we're, you know, fighting an existential threat here. So this is like, you know, we may not exist as a business unless we really get on with this. Um, and uh, th the reason that we ask this question, we start to look at these motivations. Um, and I think, Joe, we might be able to uh, just close that poll now. Let's get rid of that pop-up box. Um, there we go. Um, is that, you know, whilst there are many different motivators, and as I said, this isn't perhaps totally exhaustive, uh, I think a, a really important point here is that um, not all motivations are sort of born equal, if you like. There are, there are different, uh, there are different cognitive mechanisms for the way we process these motivations. Uh, and those are important to understand when we, when we think about the impact of those motivations and how sustainable they will be post COVID. Uh, and actually there was, uh, you know, there was some uh, intentionality in the, uh, in the way that we've put this list up because um, uh, what we've got here at the top of the list, um, you can view these motivations as if you like, types of motivational fuel. Uh, and the higher up you are up the motivational list there, that really the cleaner the fuel is. So if your motivation is the pure joy and excitement of the work that you're doing, uh, you know, you're just doing it because you love doing it, you're in flow, you lose track of time, that is sort of the purest and cleanest sort of motivational fuel. Uh, if you're right at the very bottom end of the list, um, fighting an existential threat or actually which we've got up at the bottom, but you know, fear of losing your job, um, then then that is a is a sort of dirtier sort of fuel. It's um, it's powerful, but it's it's short lived. Um, Joe, if you can move on to the next build, just to explain uh, actually what's happening. I said there are different motivational mechanisms. That basically, the higher up you are, that motivational list. Um, the more you're activating a bit of hardware in your brain called the, it's the ventral striatum, it's called the seeking system, it's part of the key reward centers of the brain. Uh, and this is the, this is the part of our brain so you know, when it's activated, it gives us a sense of wanting to explore, of wanting to learn, of wanting to extract meaning from our circumstances. Uh, and when we do that, it releases dopamine and that makes us feel good and that makes us want to do more of it. So as such, it's a very self-sustaining type of motivation. So the more we can activate the seeking system of the brain through this sort of clean motivational fuel, the more sustaining the motivation will be in the long run. Um, it's like putting a, you know, a really thick oat log on a fire. It'll take a long time to burn. Uh, the, the flip side of that is that when we, when we activate the fear system of our brain, you know, this floods our body with uh, stress hormones, um, it narrows our cognitive processing, um, our focus just becomes removal of the threat. Uh, it's an extremely powerful motivational system fear, uh, but it is quite short lived. It's a bit like instead of throwing a big, uh, you know, uh, oak log on a fire, it's like throwing sawdust on a fire. It will like flare up because uh, it's very powerful, but it's very short lived. 
it also has long-term issues for, for performance and, and health. So on the right-hand side, we're looking at, you know, the impact that these different motivational fuels can have. Uh, if we are engaging the seeking system through a heightened sense of purpose, great excitement around the work we're doing, having a common goal, then uh, that motivation is sustainable uh, for the long run. It, uh, because it expands our cognitive processing, uh, it makes us more innovative, it makes us more agile, um, it actually makes us more uh, resilient and, um, uh, in, in the long run as well. Whereas the, the fear system, whilst it's very powerful, it is short term. Uh, it does make us extremely focused. Um, if you know exactly what to do uh, and you just want somebody to do more of it for longer, then utilising the fear system can make people very focused, but it does lead to long term burnout. Uh, and what was interesting, I think, about the poll that we did is that, you know, we did have a fairly good spread of motivations, but a lot of them were down at the bottom half of the scale. And when we're activating the fear system uh, consistently and in the long run, then the behaviours that we're seeing will not be sustainable. We, we need to try and get cleaner forms of motivational fuel uh, to make those long term cultural changes that will uh, that will, will make us emerge from the crisis even stronger. Um, so uh, the, the, the next point, the next question then is, well, you know, how do you do that? If you're if you're looking to affect cultural change, um, to uh, to activate the seeking system and utilize these these pure forms of motivational fuel, um, you know, how do you do it? What what are the, the the principles for affecting cultural change in your organisation uh, at pace and at scale? Uh, now, fortunately. Um, we know the answer to this, having uh, we have worked in this field for uh, as co collectively as a firm for nearly 45 years now. And um, this is the point that I'm going to hand over to uh, to Amy to pick up on uh, the, the key principles that we see as important when affecting this change. Uh, I would just remind you before I do that, um, any questions as you go, um, pop them in the chat function, uh, either privately or, or uh, to, to everybody is absolutely fine uh, and we can pick them up in the Q&A Q that will follow. But uh, over to you Amy. Thank you Duncan and uh, either good morning, good afternoon or good evening depending on where you, you're hailing from. Um, <clears throat> so yes, as Duncan said, what I plan to share is the, the four principles that um, Duncan's um, initiated the conversation around and actually to give you some considerations around how these can be applied within the, your current organisation's context and also through the lens of really um, focusing on that seeking system um, rather than the fear system. And so this is that's if you could think about it through that lens, that would be helpful as we go through this. So the four, uh, the four principles we start off with, I think you'll, nobody will be surprised to see the number one is around purposeful leadership. What, what we mean by that is it's around really focusing on the leadership role of your organisation and to do that both in the short term and the long term. So in the short term, um, we've had conversations with clients who've done some amazing things to provide that purpose and leadership. So, for example, a couple of my um, clients that I work closely with, they pivoted and they redirected their resources um, to really focus on uh, producing personal protective equipment or um, things that relate to a societal impact rather than their day to day work. And that had a really positive impact at two levels. One is that they produced products that were desperately needed at that time. Um, but the other, from an employee point of view, is that the employees felt really connected to a purpose of the organisation that goes beyond the profit. And I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the work that's being done around and with the focus that's been um, really emphasised over the last few years around how important it is to connect your your employees with a purpose that's beyond the profit. So that's one aspect that's happened in the short term and that will um, pay dividends. Just as Duncan said earlier though, that really works in the short term and it can be connecting also with the fear system. 
So in order to really work on the seeking system in the long term, it's just pay attention to that purposefulness and the role that your organisation plays in the way you go about fulfilling your organisation's purpose on a day-to-day -day basis, not just within the crisis. So it's really keeping it going. We also associated with purposeful leadership is the providing those common goals. And again, um, during the polling, you uh, comment providing common goals was something that came out strongly. Now, the pandemic has created a very clear, <laughs> intentional, short-term goal, which is for many of our clients was actually you know, focused on survival rather than thriving. Um, having said that, the, as you make changes to survive, you're also being cognizant so that to be really effective, be cognizant of connecting with what's going to create thriving environment for your staff, as well as obviously thriving at the organisational level. So, um, for example, we had a couple of clients actually that right at the start of the pandemic made bold moves, which was around saying, you know what, we are not going to make any redundancies until the end of the year. That was bold given the circumstances as the pandemic hit. However, what it did do is provide people with the ability to park that fear response, which was you know, fear of losing their jobs, at least in the short term, and could get them to really focus on thinking around what they could do for the organisation. So we encourage you to be really focused of, um, around that. But also what it did was it um, aligned leaders in the business to be provide some air of certainty uh, even if it was short-term certainty in a sea of uncertainty that we were all facing so that's the short term if you're thinking about mid-term then what we would encourage you to do and what we've been doing with our clients up until now is really asking them, them to consider the potential how you manage within an uncertain environment. So we've supported them with scenario planning, for example. So rather than um, honing in on one possible um, way forward, it's, I suppose my equivalent would be having people be match fit so that you can pivot, you can be agile, you can respond to the changing um, envir in environment and also your changing stakeholder expectations. So it's paying attention to those things. And then as a consequence of looking and pivoting around what could the art of the possible could be, that's where within your current context, you're more able to identify the behaviours and culture that you're going to need um, in order to thrive and to emerge stronger out of this phase of um, the disruption. So we'd, we'd really encourage you to acknowledge the reality of your current culture. What are those behaviours as we've just been talking about that you've seen that you want to keep, that's been really exemplary? And I think it was Brian that mentioned that um, with the, the behaviours you know, waning, Dunk has already initiated the potential reasons as to why that might be. We also need to focus on what are those other behaviours that you're going to want to embed in order for people to have that sense of connectedness and to really to thrive as you as you emerge and emerge stronger from the crisis? The, there's a couple of other things around purposeful leadership I'll just touch on in the interest of time. One is the um, the need for leaders and the responsibility that leader we as leaders have around being the role models of those um, behaviours that you're expecting to see in others. If you don't behave that way, it's not going to be possible to expect others to do that. Um, and so that really it's about our responsibility for paying attention to that and being those role models. And last but not least, what we found with um, our clients is that they are very purposeful in their intentionality of focusing on how you shift the behaviours and the culture and shape the culture together with your organisation. So in the same way that you would do for any other strategic um, imperative. So it needs to be seen as a strategic priority. So moving on to personal change. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, why this is so critical is because as adults and as human beings, 
telling us what to do is helpful and so sharing the behaviours that are required and why they're important both for the individuals in the organisation and for the organisation results as a whole is important. If you do that but don't connect with people's emotional um, aspects it won't stick. So if any of you have ever tried to diet, I don't know why that came into my mind, you'll move swiftly on from that, um, to diet or to perhaps do um, start a new fitness regime, unless you have that insight that you that you needed in order to say this is a different way of life for me, what will happen is that you might do it, you know, it's like um, going to the gym for the first month and then there's lots of other reasons and that's really picking up on Brian's point around waning. So we need to, it needs to be insight based. And what we've done over many years is engineer those moments of insight for individuals to be able to see the value for themselves and have an emotional connection to the change and the new behavior rather than it being put on a piece of paper um, and put up on a wall. You know, this is how we expect you to behave. Another couple of things around personal change. So these are hints and tips if you're thinking around really helping people connect with their seeking system is very much around providing them with psychological safety. Give them the, making it okay for people to experiment and maybe not get it right at the first, at the first hurdle. So giving them the permission to try things differently. And in order for that to be effective, that also means that there's a lot of work that would be required around giving feedback to people when they're doing things approximately right, um, not expecting perfection, but giving the opportunity to see that they are heading in the right direction. It also means as leaders, making sure that we let people know when it's not right or whether they, where they are reverting to old habits. And to do that at a one-on-one -on -one level rather than doing that publicly. And last but not least, in terms of this principle, it's, we've always said, and it's even more, it's much, so important now, is creating that coaching environment so that people have the opportunity to see the impact of their behaviours for themselves rather than just telling them. So that's the way that they can create those habits longer term. If we move on to the third principle, this principle is all about um, broad engagement. And we, and Duncan's mentioned it already um, in terms of the, how you engage your organisation. You need to do it at pace. You need to overwhelm the current habits with the desired habits in order for those desired habits to stick. If you do this piecemeal or you don't in, engage the whole organisation and you just rely on your leaders to be the role models, it will slow down the impact, number one, and actually it would make it much harder for individuals to understand the value of the work that you're doing in relation to why those behaviours are so important. It's all about creating new habits, new habits at an individual level and at a collective level. The fourth, I think in terms of time, we're going to move on to the fourth one. Um, once you have those, but so you've got to a position where you have identified your behaviours, the desired behaviours, you've helped people to understand the value of those behaviours and they have a moment of insight around yes, they can do something differently and they want to because it is about personal choice as well. And you've had the opportunity to engage the entire organisation through that lens so that they get a sense of the value of the behaviours and they're operating. And you're also giving each other feedback um, to, to really help them to see the value and to, to make those changes, to create those new habits. If you do that without looking at all of the systems and processes that either will reinforce the positive behaviours or could get in the way of reinforcing those positive behaviours. If you don't look at those systems and processes, then um, again, you won't get those new behaviours to stick. So if I just give you a simple example to bring that to life, 
um, a lot of our HR systems and processes are there to help people to be the message that we want them to give, to, to be behaving in a particular way. So if one of your new behaviours or your behaviours that you want to dial up is to um, be really team oriented and collaborative and focus on the collective benefit rather than the personal benefit. Um, what if your, your compensation package, if people are paid for what they deliver individually, you'll find you'll get what you deserve, which is they will continue to, to um, behave in a way that drives individual performance. If you shift and pivot your um, compensation package to a lot more balance towards the, the team deliverable, then again, the behavior will be reinforced that you're wanting to, to really focus on collaboration, just as an example. Um, so the, there's these four principles. We have actually um, developed these four principles over, I'd say about 25 years. Um, when Duncan was saying about we've been in business in this business for 45 years, we, we had this realisation from our own experience and about 25 years ago we created these principles. I actually was a client before I joined the organisation and I applied these principles in our um, change efforts and so I'm very passionate about them because I know that they work. <laughs> okay, so. So I hope that's been helpful um, for you in terms of practical hints and tips. And I believe we have a little time to, to answer some questions and to, to do some Q&A. So I'm going to hand back to Duncan to, to lead that process. Thank you. Hope you found it helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Um, so in terms of Q&A, uh, again, I've had a, just a couple on the private chat. If you Want to remain anonymous and ask the question just uh, either send it to amy or i privately uh if you're happy for the group to know who you are then just pop up the group chat um but as i say um so so, so please do that now but I'll, I'll pick one up that i've had uh, on the private chat which is uh essentially saying um what what personal changes can we make to avoid burnout so if we're if we're um having the um uh, you, you know uh, um, hi highly activated fear systems which could result in long-term burnout you know what can we do about that and i think at a, there's, there's stuff you could do on a personal level but and an organizational level i think personally uh what's important for for people is number one to set some boundaries um those people who are uh, working at home have maybe doing been doing so now for uh, I've lost count of the number of weeks, but it's over three months. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the fact that work and home life can sort of bleed so much together, I think is uh, an issue for some. So setting boundaries is really important. I think it's also really important to schedule specific time in your diary for sort of deep work. Um, I think a lot of people are finding if they're working virtually that they are uh, their, their commute time, which was actually a sort of reset time and downtime is now gone, is filled up with Zoom meetings, um, maybe all day on Zoom meetings and don't have time to sort of get on with deep work. Um, uh, I mean, that's something I try and personally do now is try and schedule in a couple of hours a day to, to do that. Uh, I think what's also um, uh, important in that though is, is not just saying you're going to do it, not just putting the time in your diary, but then actually putting in place some little life hacks that will help you do it. So what do I mean by that? Um, if, you've, if you're saying, well, I'm gonna do deep work for the next two hours, actually switching your phone off or, or, or taking it to another room, uh, disabling email pop-ups, um, things like that become more and more important. Um, so, um, uh, so I think those, Duncan, those are... just um, sorry, I was just going to add that um, Brian has also suggested the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, so he's given some ideas around what people could read in order to, to um, address some of these, those questions as well. Yeah, uh, and a, a classic and still highly relevant. Um, yeah, Stephen classic, Covey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I, I, I would certainly endorse that. 
Um, so um, we've got Steve, some other questions. Yeah. Here. yeah. Shall I just um, respond um, and then please add to the question that Steve has put forward around any views on the future of the office? Who doesn't who doesn't want to come back to work in the workplace? So I'm not sure if I, um, I'm hoping I've understood it correctly, but I can remember when I was in my corporate life um, that we'd been trying to get virtual working, so remote um, meetings um, very much from a cost saving point of view because we were a global organization and people were getting on planes all the time including me and um, what um, what we realized was that people just had this tr this absolute commitment they had a conviction around face-to-face -face meetings that are the only way to really build relationship and that you couldn't do that within the virtual environment and since the pandemic started, we had no choice. We had to, you know, we have to operate virtually. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is be creative around making those connections so that it, although you're not in the physical office space, you are still seeing each other. We build trust through, um, I'm thinking of Duncan. I know Duncan's dog very well. Um, <laughs> and, so you get to know the whole person uh, rather than the just within the office. So that's one thing to be really um, to notice it, you know, appreciate that you this can work virtually. Um, yeah, just, and, just, oh, sorry, go on, go on, Duncan. Yeah. Well, I was going to say just a quick build on that in terms of future of the office. I I do see. I mean, obviously different for different organisations and depending on the nature of their work, but. Um, they're sort of knowledge-based workers. I, I think their uh, home working is here to stay, but I don't think it'll be full time. So I suspect we're going to be, uh, you know, people are going to be spending two or three days in the office uh, in the future and doing more working at home. I have found some things that are successful, but a lot of things aren't, right? So, um, uh, and I think one of the things a lot of us are suffering from is, is basically lack of variety, lack of novelty, mm -hmm. also lack of social connection. Um, so being able to sort of go back into the office, connect with people face to face does make a difference. Uh, it breaks up your routine. Um, uh, uh, whilst, you know, there are certain things we've certainly learned we can be effective. I, I also think, I mean, I've seen quite a lot of data to show that productivity after an initial dip actually has gone up uh, working remotely. I, I suspect though, I anticipate that if people just continue working exclusively remotely, that will drop off in time just because of you know all the things we've been talking about that lack of novelty lack of variety lack of social connection so i do think it's going to be a mix moving forward yeah that's a good point um, there's a lot of great questions here but i'm also very conscious we've got one minute before uh, we're due to wrap this up so um um i'm very very happy to uh, pick up on these questions um one-to-one -one. if anybody we would like to reach out to us after the call very happy to do that um if we just move forward to sort of try and conclude and wrap it up um i guess you know what we've uh, attempted to go through today is uh, you know really identify for ourselves that you know there has been many positive behavior shifts since covid the positive outcomes but importantly the motivations for these behaviors are varied um the uh, and, and you know what we should all be looking to do if we're looking for sustainability we're looking for more agility we're looking for more resilience as i think most organizations are then what we should be doing looking to do is engage the seeking system as a, a pure form of motivational fuel um, in the long run uh, and the way you do that is through applying these four culture shaping principles as amy has described um, as i said we will try and um uh, we will we'll, we'll drop you a line uh, with some further information on this very happy to pick up feel free to reach out to us if you'd like uh, to, to know anything anything more um, but uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you all this morning thank you so much for joining everybody and uh, i hope you all have a, a wonderful day thanks very much everyone. Thank you, everyone. bye